The outline of this presentation is Maxwell's equations The FDTD method Electromagnetic theory involving moving bodies Proposed implementation of motion in FDTD MATLAB code, step-by-step -step. Examples of simulations The study of electromagnetism has a rich history, beginning with the pioneering work of scientists such as James Clerk Maxwell, whose famous equations unified the laws of electricity and magnetism. Published in the mid-19th century, Maxwell's equations laid the foundation for modern electromagnetics by mathematically describing the behavior of electric and magnetic fields and their interactions with matter. These equations, which consist of four fundamental relations, remain at the core of much of physics and engineering today. In these equations, E represents the electric field, H is the magnetic field, mu is the permeability, epsilon is the permittivity, and sigma is the conductivity of the medium. These equations describe how a time-varying magnetic field induces an electric field, which is also known as Faraday's law, and how a time-varying electric field, as well as currents, induce a magnetic field, which is known as Ampere's law. We have also included the current continuity equation. Over time, as technology advanced, researchers sought methods to simulate and predict electromagnetic behavior, especially in complex systems where analytical solutions were not feasible. One of the most powerful tools developed for this purpose is the finite difference time domain. The FDTD method, first introduced by Kane Yi in 1966, became a groundbreaking computational approach because it solved Maxwell's equations numerically without any physical approximations. The key idea was to discretize the time and space domains, which allowed for the simulation of electromagnetic waves in various environments. In its early days, the FDTD method was limited by the computational power available. However, with the exponential growth in computing power over the last few decades, FDTD has become a practical tool for simulating large and complex systems. Today, the FDTD method is widely used not only in electromagnetics but also in fields like photonics, medical imaging, and even seismic modeling. Its success can be attributed to its flexibility, accuracy, and the continuous improvements made to the algorithm over the years. The steps of the FDTD analysis can be described as follows. First, by expressing Maxwell's equations in Cartesian coordinates, we obtain the six scalar partial differential equations. Next, partial differentiations respect to time and space variables will be approximated by differences. For example, the equation for X component of H field is demonstrated in this slide. Finally, E grid will be used to locate the electric and magnetic field in the discretized space. This is the flowchart of the FDTD algorithm. The analysis of electromagnetic problems with moving objects has many applications. RF Doppler radars, astrophysics, GPS, electromagnetic or optical gyroscopes. It has been an important subject of interest for a long time. Numerous investigations have been carried out in this area, which is interesting from a practical and theoretical point of view. The development of electromagnetic theory and the understanding of the interaction of light with moving objects have a rich history that dates back to the 18th and 19th centuries. Key contributions came from several scientists who studied the effects of light's interaction with moving observers, mediums, and objects. The phenomenon of starlight aberration was first discovered by James Bradley in 1727. Bradley observed that the apparent position of stars changes slightly due to the motion of the Earth. This effect, known as stellar aberration, occurs because the motion of the Earth alters the angle at which light from stars enters the telescope. The aberration angle phi can be described by the formula shown in the slide. Where theta is the true angle of the starlight when the Earth is stationary, V is the velocity of the Earth's motion, and C is the speed of light. The same effect can be observed when running into rain. As one moves, the rain appears to come from an angle, similar to how light from stars appears to change direction due to the Earth's motion. This phenomenon can be explained equally well using either the particle theory of light, as proposed by Newton, or the wave theory of light. Arago conducted experiments to test the particle theory of light using a prism. He expected that if the light speed was affected by the prism's dielectric constant, the direction of the starlight passing through it would change. However, his experiments showed that there was no change in the starlight's deviation, regardless of the prism's dielectric constant. 
This result suggested that stellar aberration is independent of the dielectric medium, challenging the particle theory of light as proposed by Newton. In 1818, Augustine Jean Fresnel proposed the concept of ether drag to explain Arago's results. Fresnel theorized that the light medium, ether, is partially dragged by a moving dielectric medium, such as a prism. He derived a theoretical coefficient that would cancel out the effect that Arago was trying to measure. This coefficient, known as the Fresnel drag coefficient, is given by the formula shown in the slide. In 1851, Hippolyte Fizeau conducted an experiment using moving water to test Fresnel's hypothesis. He measured the speed of light as it passed through water moving at high speed. The results of his experiment confirmed Fresnel's theory. This result provided strong experimental support for the Fresnel drag effect and contributed to the growing understanding of light propagation in moving media. This historical background sets the stage for the later work of Voldemar Voigt and Hendrik Lorentz. The discoveries of stellar aberration by Bradley, Arago's experiments, Fresnel's drag hypothesis, and Fizeau's confirmation through experimentation provided critical insights into how light behaves when interacting with moving observers and mediums. These early findings laid the foundation for the development of electromagnetic theory and the study of wave propagation in moving frames of reference. Voldemar Voigt, 1850-1919, a German physicist, made contributions to several areas of physics, particularly in optics and crystallography. One of his works was the introduction of what is now known as the Voigt transformation. In 1887, Voldemar Voigt was working on the convective wave equation, which describes the wave propagation as observed by a moving observer. His objective was to convert this equation into a form that corresponds to a wave equation with the observer at rest. He did that because this transformation simplified the analysis of the wave equation, particularly in terms of the propagation constant and the frequency domain. To achieve this, Voigt introduced a set of auxiliary variables, allowing the wave equation to be analyzed in the moving frame where the observer is stationary. For a one-dimensional problem, Voigt considered the wave equation for a moving observer, also known as the convective wave equation. The equation is expressed as shown in slide. Where A represents the wave amplitude, C is the wave speed, either the speed of light for electromagnetic waves or the speed of sound for acoustic waves, V is the observer's velocity, X is the spatial coordinate, and T is time. Voigt then transformed this equation using auxiliary variables. By introducing these new variables, he was able to write the equation in a simpler form that describes the wave propagation as seen by an observer at rest. The auxiliary variables are defined as slides. This reformulated wave equation describes a wave observed from a stationary frame of reference, making it more straightforward to analyze in terms of frequency and propagation characteristics. Voigt extended this approach to three-dimensional problems. For the 3D case, the auxiliary variables are defined as shown in the slide. He introduced the gamma factor as introduced in the slide. The resulting wave equation for the 3D problem, when rewritten using these auxiliary variables, takes the form shown in the slide. This equation now describes the wave propagation in a frame of reference where the observer is at rest. In his paper, titled, On the Principle of Doppler, Voigt applied this transformation to both light and sound waves. For sound waves, A represents the longitudinal pressure, and C is the speed of sound. In the case of light waves, A corresponds to the transverse light component, and C represents the speed of light. By introducing these auxiliary variables, Voigt demonstrated that the wave equations for a moving observer could be transformed into wave equations for an observer at rest, simplifying the analysis and making it possible to study the effects of motion on wave propagation. Inspired by Voldemar Voigt's auxiliary variables, Lorentz adopted these variables and later multiplied them by the gamma factor. From 1892 to 1904, Lorentz published numerous papers about the electromagnetism of moving objects. His work included the introduction of electric and magnetic field transformations, as well as time and space transformations, which made him able to explain various electromagnetic phenomena in moving frames. In his 1895 paper, Attempt of a theory of electrical and optical phenomena in moving bodies, Lorentz introduced the concept of using Voigt's auxiliary variables to transform electric and magnetic fields in a moving frame. 
He developed a set of transformations that included time and space coordinates, enabling the analysis of wave propagation for an observer in motion. With these transformations he was able to explain key phenomena in electromagnetism, such as Doppler shift, the change in frequency of a wave for an observer moving relative to the source of the wave. Lorentz used the transformations to derive the Doppler shift formula, explaining how motion affects the perceived frequency. Stellar aberration, the apparent shift in the position of stars due to the motion of the observer or the Earth. Lorentz's transformations accounted for this effect by modifying the observed direction of incoming light. Fuzzo's experiment, an experiment that measured the speed of light in moving water. Using his transformations, Lorentz successfully derived the resulting effect on light's velocity, thereby supporting the predictions of Maxwell's electrodynamics. These results were crucial in providing experimental support for Maxwell's theory of electromagnetism. Lorentz's theorem of corresponding states introduced the transformations shown in slide. Where E and H represent the electric and magnetic fields, U is the velocity vector, C is the speed of light, and T and R are the time and spatial coordinates, respectively. These transformations showed that the electromagnetic field observed in a moving frame could be expressed in terms of the fields observed in a stationary frame. In 1904, Lorentz multiplied Voigt's variables by the gamma factor. This factor accounts for the effects of length contraction and time dilation. In his paper, Electromagnetic Phenomena in a System Moving with Any Velocity Smaller Than That of Light, Lorentz multiplied the auxiliary variables by the gamma factor to refine the transformations, which now included the length contraction effect observed in moving objects. The transformations are given by the relations shown in the slide. The introduction of the gamma factor was Lorentz's attempt to explain the null result of the Michelson-Morley experiment, which aimed to detect the motion of the Earth through the hypothetical ether. By proposing that objects contract in the direction of motion, Lorentz accounted for the absence of detectable changes in the speed of light. Additionally, the gamma factor provided an explanation for the apparent increase in electron mass observed in Kaufman's experiments with particle accelerators. In the analysis of moving bodies in electromagnetism, Two primary theories based on Maxwell's equations and voigt lorentz transformations are considered, the lorentz ether theory and the special theory of relativity. While both theories are generally viewed as equivalent in terms of their agreement with experimental results, they differ significantly in their underlying physics. Space and time, in lorentz ether theory, space and time are considered absolute, while in the special theory of relativity, they are relative. Speed of light, according to lorentz ether theory, the speed of light is relative. In contrast, the special theory of relativity postulates that the speed of light is absolute in all reference frames. Voigt Lorentz transformations, in Lorentz ether theory, Voigt Lorentz transformations are not considered fundamental, except for the length contraction, gamma factor. In the special theory of relativity, these transformations are fundamental to its framework. Applicability in computational electromagnetics, for computational electromagnetics involving moving objects, Lorentz ether theory is simpler to apply especially when ignoring the gamma factor. On the other hand, the special theory of relativity involves a more complex implementation. Since the Lorentz ether theory provides a simpler approach for our computational work, we will adopt it and neglect the gamma factor during the main analysis. However, we can still incorporate the gamma factor during the preprocessing and postprocessing stages if needed. To determine when relativistic effects become significant, we define a benchmark by examining the values of the gamma factor in terms of the ratio V slash C. When the velocity V slash C is less than 0.416, the relativistic effects contribute less than 10% to the results, allowing us to neglect these effects in our analysis. The interaction of electromagnetic waves with moving objects has long been a challenging problem, especially when trying to model such interactions using numerical methods like the finite difference time domain. Several authors have applied the FDTD method for the analysis of electromagnetic problems involving moving bodies. The references are shown in this slide. These studies often use voigt lorentz transformations to account for the movement of the objects within the simulation domain. One of the major challenges in implementing such an approach is the need to incorporate relative time and space variables into a full-wave electromagnetic simulator. The complexity increases when multiple moving bodies, potentially moving at different speeds, are considered. In our new direct FDTD approach, the positions of the objects change over time according to their velocities. For a given motion speed v, 
the position of the object remains fixed for m fix multiplied by delta t, where m fix is shown in the slide. After this fixed interval, the object moves to a new grid position by one cell. This method allows us to simulate the movement of objects in a way that preserves the accuracy of Maxwell's equations without requiring relativistic corrections. One of the key advantages of our proposed method is that it can be applied to more complex scenarios, such as systems involving multiple objects moving at different velocities. Furthermore, our approach is not limited to uniform motion, it can accommodate more sophisticated cases where the velocity of an object changes over time. The proposed method is depicted in slide, where the flowchart of the FDTD method is extended to include the movement of objects. In the black colored part of the flowchart, the conventional, YE algorithm, is followed for updating the electric and magnetic fields. The new contributions, shown in red, implement the movements of sources, observers, scatterers, or fields. This implementation is flexible and can accommodate a wide range of motion scenarios, including uniform and non-uniform motion. This brute force approach provides a direct solution to non-relativistic electromagnetic problems involving moving bodies. In this technique, time is implicitly treated as absolute, and Voigt-Lorentz transformations are not required. Instead, Maxwell's equations are solved using the classical formulation, which remains valid for most practical electromagnetic problems, especially in fields like antennas and wave propagation, where the objects move at non-relativistic speeds. Now, I'm going to walk you through a MATLAB script that sets up the foundation for a numerical electromagnetic simulation using the finite difference time domain method. Let's break down the code step by step. First I will describe main.m file. Step 1, clearing the workspace and setting global variables, we start by closing all open figures, clearing the workspace, and resetting the command window. This ensures that no residual variables or figures interfere with the new simulation. Step 2, defining physical constants. Next, we define some essential physical constants used in electromagnetic simulations. These constants include vacuum permittivity epsilon underscore zero, vacuum permeability mu underscore zero, and the speed of light C0, calculated using the fundamental relation between epsilon underscore zero and mu underscore zero. Step 3, defining spatial and time discretization. We define the spatial grid sizes, delta underscore x, delta underscore y, delta underscore z, and the time step, delta underscore t, based on the current stability condition. This condition ensures numerical stability in the FDTD simulation. Step 4, frequency and time settings, we define the frequency of the source wave, calculate the angular frequency omega, and specify the number of frequency samples, nf, for the simulation. The variable skip is used for skipping the frames produced in FDTD algorithm for illustration of the electric fields in 3D space. Step 5, material and velocity parameters. Here, we specify the relative permittivity epsar, the velocity of the object in the simulation, velocity, and the initial viewing angle for visualization. Step 6, source parameters. We define the source parameters, including its dimensions, source underscore widths, source underscore widthy, source underscore widths, and distance, r underscore source. The source is essential in generating the electromagnetic waves in the simulation. Step 7, perfectly matched layer, PML, settings, the PML is a boundary condition used to absorb outgoing waves and prevent reflections. We define the PML's conductivity PML underscore sigma and its width PML underscore width. Step 8, simulation timing and control variables, we define the total simulation time, the incident time, and other variables for controlling the simulation. Alright. Let's continue explaining this part of the MATLAB code step by step. Step 9, velocity loop and initial calculations. Here, the code loops through different values of velocity, which represents the speed of the object in the simulation. The time step, TTTT, is computed based on the incident time, and a variable simulated underscore V is calculated to match the spatial grid with the simulation time step. Step 10, structure definition and grid setup. The physical size of the simulation domain is defined in terms of x underscore size, y underscore size, and z underscore size, and these are then translated into the number of cells in each direction, cell underscore x, cell underscore y, cell underscore z. The code also sets up the spatial coordinates, xx, yy, zz, for each cell. Step 11, source and observation points. The source of the electromagnetic wave is defined at specific coordinates, 
x underscore source, y underscore source, z underscore source, and two observation points are also defined to track the electric field at different positions in the simulation space. Step 12. Boundary conditions. The code then sets up second-order Moore's absorbing boundary condition, ABC, coefficients, K1 underscore X and K2 underscore X, which help absorb outgoing waves and prevent reflection at the boundaries. Step 13. Defining material parameters, the relative permeability, Mu underscore R, and permittivity, Epsilon underscore R, are initialized as ones across the simulation space, indicating that the material is air or vacuum. Step 14. Source definition and time loop initialization. The source signal is defined as a sinusoidal wave with a specific frequency, and in step 15, arrays for the electric, E underscore X, E underscore Y, E underscore Z, and magnetic fields, H underscore X, H underscore Y, H underscore Z, are initialized on the GPU for faster computation. Step 16. Main time loop and field updates. This is the main time-stepping loop for updating the electric and magnetic fields based on Maxwell's equations. The loop iterates over time steps, updating the field values for each cell in the grid. Step 17. In this section, we are simulating a moving object within the FDTD grid by shifting the object's position after each specific time, m fix multiplied by delta t. Specifically, this code modifies the SSSX, SSSE, SSSZ, and voxel grid matrices, which represent the state of the object in the FDTD simulation space. These matrices are being updated to simulate the motion of the object within the grid. Let's break it down step by step. Apply moving condition at specific time steps, the movement is applied only at certain time steps, determined by the condition. The mod function checks if the current time step, t, is a multiple of tt. This ensures that the object's position is updated periodically during the simulation. TTT is actually M fix multiplied by delta T. The matrices SSSX, SSSE, and SSSZ store information about the object's presence in the simulation grid along the X, Y, and Z dimensions. Each matrix is being shifted along the first dimension, X axis SSSX, 2, and, colon comma, this shifts all elements in the matrix by one position in the X direction, effectively moving the object forward by one cell. Zeros, size, SSSX, 1, colon, comma, adds a new layer of zeros at the back of the matrix, which clears the last row, as the object moves out of that space. By doing this for SSSX, SSSE, and SSSZ, we are simulating the movement of the object along all three field polarizations, X, Y, and Z. The voxel grid matrix, which holds the voxelized representation of the moving object, is also shifted. This has a similar effect as with the SSSX, SSSE, and SSSZ matrices, the contents of voxel grid are shifted forward in the X direction. A layer of zeros is appended at the end, leaving an empty space behind the moving object. This shift effectively moves the object one cell forward along the X axis in the simulation grid. Summary of movement, at every specified time step, TTT, this section of code shifts the object forward within the FDTD simulation space by one cell. The periodic update ensures that the object appears to be moving smoothly within the grid, and the newly created empty cells, filled with zeros, ensure that the simulation adapts to the new position of the object. This movement is critical in simulating how electromagnetic waves interact with moving objects over time. Step 18, Observation and Real-Time Plotting During the simulation, the electric field at the observation points is recorded, EZ underscore observe underscore 1, EZ underscore observe underscore 2, and real-time plotting of the field distribution is performed using Imagesk and SURF for 2D and 3D visualization, respectively. Step 19. Saving the results. The code writes the simulation results to a video file at a frame rate of 30 FPS using MATLAB's video writer function. The 2D and 3D plots are captured and saved in two separate videos. Step 20. Simulation completion and cleanup. Once the time loop completes, the simulation results are saved, and the video files are closed. The code also displays a progress message to estimate how much time remains for the simulation. This code implements an advanced FDTD simulation, incorporating moving objects and boundary conditions. It provides real-time field visualization and saves the results to video for analysis. This part of the MATLAB code namely, file underscore 3D underscore 2 underscore matrix underscore converter.m, 
converts a 3D model, in STL format, into a 3D matrix, also known as a voxel grid, where the 3D space is divided into small cubes, voxels. Let's break down the code step by step. Step 1, clear workspace and initialize. Before starting the process, we clear the workspace, close all figures, and clear the command window. Step 2, load the 3D model. The code reads an STL file, which represents the 3D object geometry, using the stored function. The STL file is assumed to be converted from a step file and is named hand.stl. The faces and vertices of the 3D model are extracted for later use. Faces, these represent the triangular facets that define the 3D object. Vertices, these are the points that define the corners of the triangular facets. Step 3, voxelization. Voxelization is the process of converting a 3D object into a set of small cubes, voxels, within a defined grid. 3.1, define voxel resolution. The size of each voxel is defined by voxel size, which determines the resolution of the grid. Smaller voxel sizes result in finer resolution. 3.2, calculate the bounding box of the model. The bounding box is the smallest rectangular box that completely encloses the 3D model. The X range, Y range, and Z range define the extent of the model in the X, Y, and Z directions, respectively. 3.3, create the 3D grid. The mesh grid function creates a 3D grid of points that will later be used to check if they are inside the model. These grid points correspond to the centers of the voxels. 3.4, initialize the voxel matrix. The voxel matrix voxel grid is initialized with zeros. This matrix will store the voxel representation of the 3D model, where a 1 indicates a filled voxel, inside the model, and a 0 indicates an empty voxel, outside the model. Step 4, check points inside the model. The code checks which points on the grid are inside the model using the inpolyhedron function. The inpolyhedron function tests whether points are inside or outside a 3D polygon, in this case, the STL model. The points inside the model are then set to 1 in the voxel grid. 4.1, create a list of points, the grid points are reshaped into a list of 3D points. 4.2, find points inside the model, the inpolyhedron function checks which points are inside the 3D model, and the corresponding indices are marked in the voxel grid. Step 5, display the voxelized model. The voxelized model is displayed using a 3D scatter plot, where only the filled voxels, voxel grid equals equals 1, are plotted. Step 6, save the voxel grid. The final voxelized model is saved to a.mat file for future use. Summary, this script takes a 3D object, in STL format, converts it into a voxelized representation using a defined resolution, and stores the result in a 3D matrix. The voxelized model is displayed and saved for further analysis or simulations. This part of the code namely, s underscore update.m, is designed to convert a 3D matrix, voxel grid, into specific conditions for field simulation. The voxel grid represents the 3D model in the simulation domain, and the code assigns values to the simulation matrix to indicate the presence of objects. Here's the explanation step by step. Step 1, load the voxel grid and adjust orientation. The voxel grid is loaded from a save.mat file and its orientation is adjusted by reversing one axis and permuting others. This step ensures the voxel grid aligns correctly with the simulation domain. Step 2, initialize the voxel grid in the simulation domain. The voxel grid is placed inside the larger simulation grid. The voxel grid matrix is initialized and the object is placed at the center of the simulation space. The indices are adjusted using offsets, NNN1, NNN2, NNN3, to ensure proper alignment. Step 3, fill the SSS matrices, the SSSX, SSSE, and SSSZ matrices are filled based on the values in the voxel grid. These matrices represent the structure in the simulation, where 1 indicates the presence of an object, and 0 indicates an empty cell. 3.1, fill the SSSX matrix, this loop fills the SSSX matrix for the X dimension. 3.2, fill the SSSE matrix. This loop fills the SSSE matrix for the Y dimension. 3.3, fill the SSSZ matrix. This loop fills the SSSZ matrix for the Z dimension. Summary, this part of the code takes a 3D voxel model, processes it to fit within the simulation grid, and then assigns object presence to specific matrices, SSSX, SSSE, SSSZ 
which will later be used to determine how the electromagnetic fields interact with the object in the simulation domain. Let's go step by step through this part of the code, namely, g underscore update.m, which fills the matrix GGG based on the position of the source within the simulation domain. The matrix GGG is used to mark the region of the source in the simulation space, where it will generate the electromagnetic waves. Step 1, iterating over the simulation grid, the outer loops iterate over the entire simulation space in the x, y, and z directions. The purpose of these loops is to evaluate every point in the grid to check if it lies within the source region. Cell underscore x, cell underscore y, and cell underscore z are the dimensions of the simulation grid. The loop checks every grid point, i, j, k, to determine if it is inside the source region. Step 2, checking source region. Inside the nested loops, the code checks whether the grid point, i, j, k, is within the boundaries of the source. The inpolyhedron.m function in MATLAB is used to determine whether points in 3D space lie inside or outside a 3D polyhedron, which is typically defined by its faces, triangular facets, and vertices. This function is particularly useful when working with 3D models, like those imported from STL or OBJ files, and allows you to perform operations like voxelization, collision detection, or geometry processing. Here's a breakdown of the function, syntax. Faces, a matrix that defines the connectivity of the vertices in terms of triangular facets. Each row contains three indices corresponding to the vertices that form a triangular face. Vertices, a matrix that contains the 3D coordinates, X, Y, Z, of the vertices of the polyhedron. Points, a matrix of 3D points that you want to check if they are inside the polyhedron. Each row represents the coordinates of a point. The function returns a logical array in, where each element corresponds to a point in points. If a point is inside the polyhedron, the corresponding value is true, or 1, if it is outside, the value is false, or 0. Example. In this example, the first point, 0.250.250.25, is inside the tetrahedron, so its value is 1. The second and third points, 111, and, dash 0.5 minus 0.5 minus 0.5, are outside the polyhedron, so their values are 0. Use case in our code, in our code, in polyhedron is used to check which points from a 3D grid are inside a 3D model. We are voxelizing a model by checking if each voxel in our grid lies inside the polyhedron, and then marking the corresponding voxel as filled, 1, or empty, 0, in our voxel grid. This step is essential in converting a 3D model into a voxel representation because it allows us to identify which parts of the grid represent the actual geometry of the object. Performance considerations. For large polyhedra or a dense grid of points, the inpolyhedron function can become computationally expensive. To improve performance, we can reduce the number of points being checked, for example, by limiting the resolution of the voxel grid, or pre-filter points to exclude those that are obviously outside the bounding box of the polyhedron. This part of the code namely, pml.m, is creating a spatial distribution of the sigma parameter, which is typically used in perfectly matched layer, PML, regions in electromagnetic simulations, like FDTD. PML is used to absorb outgoing waves and prevent reflections at the boundaries of the simulation domain. Step-by-step -step explanation. Step 1, iterating over the simulation grid, the code starts by iterating over every point in the 3D simulation grid defined by cell underscore x, cell underscore y, and cell underscore z. These loops ensure that every grid point, i, j, k, is processed. Step 2, check for inner region, no absorption the first if statement checks if the grid point, i, j, k, is inside the simulation domain but far from the boundary regions where the PML layer exists. If this condition is true, the sigma value at this grid point is set to zero, no absorption. PML underscore width, the width of the PML boundary. Delta underscore x, delta underscore y, grid cell sizes in the x and y directions. The condition checks whether the point is in the middle region of the grid, far from the PML boundaries, where there should be no absorption, hence, sigma equals zero. Step 3, assigning sigma values for PML zones, four points closer to the boundary, the code applies increasing values of sigma, absorption coefficient, as the grid point approaches the PML region. This gradation is key to ensuring smooth absorption of the outgoing waves. 
Outer PML region, full absorption if the point is closest to the boundary, in the outermost part of the PML region, sigma is set to the maximum value, full absorption. Gradual increase toward the boundary, as the grid point moves from the middle region of the domain towards the boundary, the sigma values gradually increase. The absorption coefficients are applied in five steps, starting from zero in the middle and increasing towards the boundary. Second zone, first layer from PML edge. Third zone. Fourth zone. Fifth zone, closest to the outer boundary. Each of these conditions gradually increases the sigma value as the grid points get closer to the boundary, ensuring a smooth transition of wave absorption as the waves exit the domain. Step 4, continue for all grid points. The nested loops continue for all grid points in the simulation domain, applying the above conditions to calculate the sigma value for each point. Summary, this code is setting up the absorption profile for the PML boundaries in an FDTD simulation. It ensures that points far from the boundary, in the center of the simulation, have no absorption, while points closer to the boundaries have increasing absorption values. This gradual transition ensures that outgoing waves are smoothly absorbed by the PML, preventing reflections back into the simulation domain. And now finally these are the results of direct FDTD analysis for different 3D objects. First simulation is the simulation of a stationary human hand illuminated by a line source. The second simulation is the simulation moving Piper PA-28 Cherokee illuminated by a line source. Third one is the illumination by the line source of a moving Boeing airplane. Fourth one is moving spaceship. And the last one is the moving dielectric asteroid stone. Thank you all so much for watching. I hope you found this video helpful and that you've gained some valuable insights from it. If you enjoyed this content and would like to see more tutorials, explanations, and walkthroughs just like this one, please make sure to hit the subscribe button and turn on the notification bell so you never miss an update. Your support helps me continue creating educational content, and I'd love to hear from you. If you have any questions, suggestions, or topics you'd like me to cover in future videos, feel free to leave a comment below. Once again, thank you for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Take care, and happy learning!